It's, uh, it's a privilege to be able to gather and, um, in this way and, and worship with you. My name's Micah, and if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, I'd um, love to be able to say hello to you after the service. I'll be hanging out kind of by our Next Steps table following things. Um, I get the privilege to serve here as our lead pastor, and you've joined us on a great week. If you're a guest today, we're starting a new teaching series that um, will actually carry us quite a bit through the summer. So um, usually our teaching series runs something like four or five weeks, but uh, we're going to walk through the Ten Commandments. You'll see the uh, idea of the series is ten, and we're going to talk about what that means and set that up today and um, dive into that first commandment as, as well. Uh, and really our heart behind the series is what we just were singing about. If you believe you have a good, good father who's perfect in all of his ways, he loves you and he cares about you, and then he gives you instructions. If we can lean in in faith and believe whatever he's asking us to do comes out of his heart and out of his wisdom and out of his purposes and out of his perfection, then wouldn't the wisest thing for us to do be to, to, to lean in and learn from that? And so I'm excited about the series and how God's, uh, I think, going to use that for us throughout um, throughout this summer. And so I encourage you, I know travel is a frequent thing over the summer as well. Um, don't forget about your time with God over the summer. And so your time in the Word, uh, even as you travel, your uh, time here at Harvest, if you can't be here, catch things online and, and let God continue just to grow and, and develop you in the, in the weeks and the next couple months um, ahead. Now, I was thinking about this gift that I have. I've got an iPad that helps from teaching here. And this is a not too old of an iPad, but do you, if you can remember when that technology, like the iPhone came out and then the other high, uh, on the heels of that, there was like this generation. This was the very first right generation of iPad. And I remember just thinking like, that's going to be amazing, right? Like what a great, I need one of those, you know, need, right? Not want. You ever, parents, you have kids, you talk about needs and wants. Um, I wanted one of those. So that my employer at the time, though, unbeknownst to me, as a Christmas gift, bought um, a couple of the pastors on staff like an iPad. It was one of these, right? And so I had, imagine if my reaction, though, like for this great new device had been, why in the world would you do that? Like, this is a new technology, and I'm going to have to learn how to use it. And I, I, I don't know what to do with that. And why would you give me this thing? Now I have to learn how to use it and, and function with it. And how restrictive, right? What, how mean of you to like tell me that I have to do this thing. Like I already have my other way of doing life. I don't need one of those very ungrateful and very unwise of an approach, right? Like we, I wouldn't. I was, I was excited about the thing. And I was thinking about this as an example of kind of, I'm not going to say for you, but maybe the person next to you. Sometimes when it comes to like God giving you something, when it comes to instructions, your response is kind of that way, like, oh, how restrictive. Like, why would you tell me what I have to do? Like, I, I got my way of doing things. I just, I like to do it this way. Don't, you know, bind me with your rules that I have to follow. And, and I think if we get God's commands and God's words, it feels much more like a gift to us than it, than it does that. Um, it's a lot like, if you think of uh, our lives, I think we're a lot like a, a car in a way. A car gives us a good example of this. While we're on the Apple thing, this isn't real. But I don't know if you ever came across this. There was like for a decade rumors of the Apple car like that was going to come about. And I don't know if it was ever really a thing or not, but um, that never existed. And I hear that plan is done. Okay, so, uh, but w wouldn't that have been amazing? You know, a Samsung car, I don't know about, but... All right, but, but a car maybe is a good illustration if you think about the complexity of a car and all the parts that go into it. Was, I was just talking with somebody um, on our leadership team about how complex cars have gotten, right? Like there was the taillight of his car was out. And it's like, I, I can't even figure out how to get the thing open anymore to change a taillight. That becomes like a take it to the dealer approach with the new car these days. But cars are very complex and so are you. Uh, you may not be... Uh, wired the same way as a car, but you're, you're physically wired in a much more complex system than any car today, yet alone like how, how complex you are physiologically, not only, but like psychologically, relationally. I mean, you think changing the oil or changing a taillight is complicated? Try to be married for 35 years, right? And figure that dynamic out. Well, we are complex beings relationally, emotionally, socially, right? So in a car, 
you've got a manual, right, like a maintenance manual. It tells you when you need to change the oil and how to do some minor repairs. Apparently not how to change your taillight, but maybe other things. Now, if we think about in God's, God's word, God's given us, likewise, instructions, a manual for how to live life. Like he's the designer of it, and he gives us these rules to follow as instructions and understanding for how we can, how we can live life together. Um, another pastor smarter than me described the, the whole Bible. If you think of the um, commandments, maybe it's God's like instruction manual. The rest of the Bible really is his repair manual, right? Because we violate God's commandments because of like the sin in our lives, our relationships are broken, our relationship with God, with people. And the rest of the Bible is this plan of God for how to restore what we've broken. We have so much that we, we can learn from God's instructions. I'm excited for this series, but really uh, throughout your life, do you spend time in God's word with this expectation that he's good and he's going to use this to change me, to help me, um, to grow me, to develop me, that, that his instructions, his commands are, are for your good. I, I hope that you do. And I hope this series will help us even with that approach in our in our lives. And the reality is with these commandments, like others, if we break them, our lives are broken. You know, but when we follow them, when we lean into God's wisdom and his, his instructions, especially in this, this top 10 list that we're going to go through over the summer, when we follow them, life works the way God's designed it to work. And we, we find that success, by God's definition, <clears throat> is what is the fruit of that, that, that we live a life designed the way that God meant it to, to be lived. And so we're going to dive in <clears throat> to, to a commandment each, um, each week of this series and uh, give a little bit of a setup to just where we're, we're going with that. And I, I think this series is going to also push back on a misunderstanding we have about freedom. We'll see in a minute in this passage that the context of the commandments that God gives his people is actually the Exodus story. So if you want to get ready in your Bibles to follow along with us, um, you can do a couple things. Danny mentioned that program that you could scan the QR code. That'll take you to kind of the cheat sheet for today. There's some sermon notes there and references. Um, you can also uh, open up your Bible if you have one with you to Exodus chapter 19. And we're going to read a little bit from the end of chapter 19 and then Exodus 20. And, and the context of this is really... In that Exodus story, you think of two sections of Exodus. It's a long book in your Old Testament. The first half is maybe the most familiar part to most people. It's the story of how God freed the Israelites, his people, out of Egyptian slavery, parted the Red Sea, right? He uses Moses in this miraculous way to free his people from slavery to Egypt. Then the second half of Exodus, from kind of chapter 20 onward, is really God's now his instructions to this now freed people. In chapter 19, right in the middle, is this pivot point where we hear God's heart. The God who freed them physically is now going to give them instructions to free them relationally, spiritually, to set them on a path of what, what life was supposed to be like and following him directly. And in 19, um, if we take a look at that together, we're going to see um, this setup. You can read with me here about uh, Moses and his encounter that he is going to have between him and God. We get this context, this conversation between God and Moses before he gives us the 10 commandments and those laws. And look at this. He says, says this, while Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain. So God's people through the desert, he's already led them miraculously. Now they're at the foot of Mount Sinai. And God speaks to Moses, calling him up the mountain, saying, uh, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, look at this, that you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. All of the, the plagues, the miraculous things God did to free them there. The parting of the Red Sea, the drowning of Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. God's reminding them, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. And catch this, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Before we get to instructions, God's reminding his people what he has already done. Before he ever asks them for anything, God's reminding them, I, I freed you in this powerful way from Egypt physically. I... I bore you on eagle's wings. There's this, I don't know if you know this, but this practice I'm told with, with eagles when they train an eaglet, like on how to fly, where they actually carry that baby out of the nest on the wings to drop it 
so that it learns to fly. And if it doesn't on the first time, that eagle can swoop below, catch it, and try again. Like God is giving this picture of this care, this nurture, this love, this comfort. Like I, I've got you. I've guided you. And he gives this context to the instructions he's going to give them. You know, this series that we said, uh, the title of the series is really about, well, success in God's design of, of life. We said 10 rules for success. And if you think about well, what does it mean to succeed, there's an intention that we have to understand. So uh, to succeed, according to Webster's, right, you've got a couple ideas. To turn out well, uh, I, I think I would like my life to turn out well. I mean, if you're with somebody you care about, you can look at them and say, you've turned out well. All right. You can look at your second favorite person and say, you've turned out pretty well too. Okay. Um, but we want it to turn out well in life. Uh, the second definition, to attain a desired object or or end. God's commandments are designed for our success. And some of you, maybe you saw this series, and you're like, this is going to be like a, I sure hope not like a wealth kind of gospel thing. No. God, though, gets to define what success in life looks like. His commandments lead us in the direction of what he has defined. He actually has an end in mind, and he's going to guide us to that end, the way an eagle can carry its own eaglet. God lovingly carries us forward. And so we have this uh, idea that if, I think as parents, you might get this. Um, I, I imagine if you've raised kids or you're in the process of raising kids, you have some house rules, you know, rules and family rules. You, you give instructions to your kids. Now, here's the thing. Did you uh, have kids first or instructions for the kids first? Which one? Kids, right? Like the whole point is you have kids, you desire for them to turn out well. So you're trying to guide them, even if imperfectly, through your instructions in life. You don't have kids for the sake of giving instructions. I don't imagine. Maybe somebody did. That's a little twisted, right? We have family chores. Um, we didn't have kids so that someone could do the chores, right? But we do have chores that our kids in our house do. But the, the instructions come second, right? The chores come second because we're raising kids and we desire for them to grow uh, well in life. This is what God is doing in, in us. Let's continue back in Exodus reading together. It says this, um, so now, uh, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, this is God still giving context, right? We haven't gotten to the first commandment yet. But he says, if you will obey my voice and keep my, what's that word? Covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. If you will obey my voice and keep my, my covenant. Covenant. So God is establishing a relationship between him as God, as the sovereign king in this relationship. And his people. And he's defining these, these ten commandments are part of like a covenant document between God and his, his people. Let me give you just a little bit of bonus, all right, to kick off this series. When you think about the uniqueness of what God does in the ten commandments, like maybe you're on a journey and, and perhaps you're still discovering what you think about this Christianity thing and, and the Bible. And uh, I, I think this will be a little bonus for you if that's the case. The reality is what God has done starting in the Old Testament, was absolutely unique in the setting of these commands that he gave. Um, it was not abnormal in this ancient area where Israel was. It, was. it was normal that you would have these treaties or these covenant treaties, maybe between a king and his, his people. But here's what's totally unique. A few things about the Ten Commandments. First, they are the first example of a covenant um, with a whole people group. Secondly, there, these treaties... Um, other treaties only dealt with how the people relate to the ruler, right? The God or the king. It's what the people does. In the Ten Commandments, God describes also how everyone relates to each other. That he's giving this context of human relationships. It's not about what he gets from us. It's what about he's designing for us. It's good news. The third thing, um, there's not just uh, religious rules to follow. But there's, like I mentioned, these relational rules to follow. There's, there's social responsibility. In other words, what God's going to command is not just about he and us, but about our relationships and how we're designed to thrive. And fourthly, they're, they're extremely simple. They're absolute. Uh, and they're unconditional. So 
these, this top 10 list of God, we, we've got a picture. You might have grown up with some illustrations or kids' Bible stories with the massive stone tablets, right? And Moses coming down with, they kind of look like the McDonald's arch usually, right? These two, these two stone tablets, because we're told there's two and that's true, but they, they could have been big like that. But the words, there are so few words encompassing the Ten Commandments, they could easily have been carved on something much smaller as well, smaller tablets. These words, though, they're unconditional. They're direct and, and they're simple. And the context of it is that God himself has spoken, that God has given words that we are, we are to follow. All right, you ready to jump in to number one? Anybody ready? A few of you? All right, we'll just wrap it up. You're not really interested in the story. I, so just to mess with you a little bit, thank you. Um, depending on your church background, we're going to get all the way through commandment one. And you're going to think, he didn't get all the way through commandment one. We're going to start commandment two next week. And depending on your background, you might think, that's still commandment one. What's the deal? It's interesting. So Jewish tradition, Catholic tradition, Protestant tradition, highlight the Ten Commandments, but have a different understanding of where one and two depart. So, uh, so if I mess with you um, today and you're from a Catholic background, you might be like, he didn't finish it. There's more to it. And I'm going to really mess with you next week when you're like, you're calling number one, number two. But can we just agree? Um, they're really important. And we're going to get through all of the words of the section. Uh, and our numbering may confirm what you thought or may frustrate you. Um, but let God speak to you regardless. All right. So number one, as we talk through this, we see God's instructions uh, on this. Um, so let me just skip past that. That is God's people on Mount Sinai. And then, so they're at the foot of the mountain. Thunder and lightning. Moses is up. And we've got God giving these commandments. God spoke. Who spoke? God. All of these words, notice I keep referring to them as commandments and they have that implication. Literally in the Old Testament, these are the 10 words, the 10 instructions that God gives. Um, the word, there is a word in the Hebrew for commandment, but God calls them his, his words. He's speaking instructions to us saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Again, God reminds them before he gives any commandment, the first commandment, really the first word of these 10 is God reminding people who he is and what he's already done for them. Think about that. When you have something that you, you're burdened by emotionally, relationally, and you're thinking about bringing that to, to God for help, do you remember all of the ways he's already proven faithful in the past? God starts first telling people, hey, remember what I've just done for you. Now lean in. I love you. I've carried you like on eagle's wings. Now let me tell you how to live. This is the context of God's commandments for us. He spoke these words, these 10 words. It's where a little bonus for you, where we get the idea of the Decalogue, if you ever heard that referred to, is Deca for the Greek words, Log from Logos for the Greek for, sorry, Deca for 10 and Logos for words together. Exodus 20 is God's 10 words, life-giving words to us. He reminds them what he's done for this. And then he says, you shall have no other gods before me. I don't know your church background. When I think of the Ten Commandments, if you had to like list them, you're given a test and like, I think they're important, but okay, name them. Uh, where most people go to first is the thou shalt nots, right? Like thou shalt not, and you get like four or five and like, I know there's more, but I definitely remember like, we don't murder, we shouldn't commit adultery, thou shalt not uh, covet. Maybe we come up with that, but do you, do you remember the whole context of God's commands? Start with, I love you. I've already cared for you. Keep me first. Don't have any other God before me. If you think that sounds a little, I don't know, bold on God's behalf, how absolutely good news would it be, right? If God really is the one that we've sung songs about before, who cares for us, who guides us, wouldn't the most kind thing, that God who's in control, who knows his plans for you, wouldn't the most kind thing for him to do would be to demand, don't put anyone before me. I get to be first in your life. 
when we break this, there's no way to break any of the commandments, any of God's instructions without first, we violate this, right? Something becomes more important to us in that moment in our life or in that season. Something comes before God. And so if we keep him first, really the rest of our lives line up in, in the rest of the commandments. God, God says to have no other gods before me. The title today, I'd said, there could be two titles. We got summarized this command is, I am God alone. This has implications for us, right? It has implications for not just um, really what is a, there's a monotheistic belief, right? Like there's one God ultimately. Any other quote gods are just false gods. There's another big word, henotheism. It's the idea that, well, you might believe there are multiple gods, but we're demanding one God that we worship. What God is doing is both of those. There's a reinforcing that he's really the one and only God. But no matter your worldview, he's first. Whatever other powers or authorities or things there are, he's it. He's at the top and demands our obedience. If we were to put this title in, I'm going to annoy some of you non-Swifty fans out there. If we were to put this in pop culture lingo, lingo, it might look like, hi, it's God. I'm the only one. It's me. If you have no idea what that means, that's okay. And your life's probably better because of it. So, um, but God, God's saying, I'm it. Hey, hey, focus here. Pay attention to me. I love you. I care for you. I'm the one that has authority to tell you what to do next. Will you trust me? Do we lean in to what he would do? And so what we're going to see each week through each of these commandments is we're going to walk through like a few things, what they reveal about God or what they confront in us. And so today, let's start with what does this commandment reveal about God and, and who he is? We've talked about it a little bit already, but we've said, first of all, there's only one God, right? God is reminding these people that he's led out of physical slavery, that regardless of their background, regardless of what the Egyptians and that culture had taught them, that he, he alone is God. And this is good news. Man, there are mixed up, messed up beliefs about God in our culture today. Am I right? That was absolutely true and got this like ancient Israel and culture of what, what a God might expect people to do. To just name one that was in that area, right? That belief in a God, Moloch. Well, Moloch demanded things like uh, sacrifices of humans, especially children, to appease him. This is the context that these people of Israel would have been surrounded by these beliefs and these false gods. God is saying, hey, I met I'm going to define what I am. You, you don't actually get to choose what I am. (laughs) I am who I am. That's actually the basis of his name and his covenant name, Yahweh, that God gives his people through Moses. He says, I am who I am. I define who I am to you and what it means to worship me. And that's really good news because, man, there are messed up views about who God is. He's, He's the only God. And secondly, it also reveals that He's involved in our lives. Again, he starts off reminding them, I'm the one who freed you from Egyptian slavery. I've walked you through up to this point. I can carry you in this next season as well. That God wasn't just a God who was kind of like the clockmaker who made everything and got it started and then that's the end of his involvement and now it's just winding forward until it stops. No, God has been actively involved in his creation and he always will be. He's involved in your life. God, God loves you. That's not just some abstract thing. When we say that God loves you, it means that he actually thinks about you. He has plans for you. He guides steps for your good. That even if you're a follower of Jesus, even even when the worst, seemingly worst and painful things happen in your life, God is working somehow to weave that into something for your good and for his glory. Like he's, he's guiding circumstances. He's not just good, but he's involved in your life. And so we're reminded of that from, from this first commandment. Each commandment we're going to see each week, it also um, it confronts us. We might not like that one as much, but we would be wise when we read a commandment. We're like, what is it about us that if we don't pay attention to that, where do we go off? All right. So each week we're going to ask that question as well. In this instance of confrontation, well, we're reminded that these are, they're commandments. They're God speaking. 
So they carry authority in our lives, right? So I think we need to be reminded that God actually gets to define our purpose in life. God gets to define what success as a human being looks like. Um, God defines what worship of him looks like. And we're going to see in this particular command, there's a, there's a conf- confrontation or a challenge. Um, God challenges our idolatry. So God is saying, I alone am God, have no other gods before me. You might think, well, that's, I mean, that's really important for these guys right, way back then because they were just messed up and kind of dumb religiously and they'd have these gods and these idols and thank God I don't do that. You know, I don't have a thing that I carved with my hands and I worship and I, and I pray to, so I'm off the hook. Eh, maybe. <laughs> um, I think we need a reminder that uh, God still confronts well, the idolatry in our heart, we're going to explain that a little bit more in a minute, but we see in this prophet in the Old Testament um, from the book of Kings in Elijah, he, um, this confrontation of God's people who are like half in, half out on following him. It's like, well, we kind of believe in God, but just to cover our bases, maybe we worship this God over here too, and I don't want to make him mad if he's real, and so we're kind of worshiping both. You know, let's just add in this belief to God. And Elijah says to them this, um, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? The Lord, if the Lord, Yahweh, if the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, this other false god, then follow him. Like Elijah's calling him out, pick. Like, don't say I really follow God, but uh, I'm also going to do this other thing over here that's in opposition to what he said, just, just in case. And again, some of you are like, I don't do that. You know, I don't have a false idol or false god. I think this might make us a little more uncomfortable if we allow, what does an idol mean? And that's maybe not just a a stone statue that I pray to. But what what does worship mean? Uh, What does it look like to add something that maybe becomes too important in our life? The ands that we put on things. And for some of us, there's a reality of, our financial resources and money. Like Jesus confronts this very deliberately and specifically when Jesus is preaching and he says, well, no one can serve two masters. Sounds a little bit like Elijah, right? Like stop limping between this or that. He says, no one can serve two masters for he will either hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And he goes on to say, you can't serve both God and mammon or money. You pick who is going to be first in your life? And so we have this great tendency to try to add, add things into um, our, our worship of God being, being alone. And so how do, we, how do we obey this commandment, though? We're going to see that each week of this series as well. How do we, uh, how do we obey this first commandment? And um, we really are encouraged, right? If God is God alone, then we should worship God exclusively. This is what Elijah was getting at to his people, like, pick. Are you going to worship Yahweh the Lord or Baal? Stop doing both. Like if God is who he says he is, he alone is the one that we, we worship in our lives. Worship God exclusively. You may feel like that's, that's good because I, um, I do that. Again, the idols in our hearts aren't, aren't as clear as maybe the false gods that Elijah was confronting but I still think they can be very real. Think about the idea of worship. Um, if our worship is what we most desire, what we love most, what our devotion is most given to, man, can there be other things that creep in when God is saying, keep me first and worship me alone, that there are these other things that pull our heart in, into and our devotions toward that become false gods. Think about maybe defining a false god a little differently. What if it was something like this? Anything you put your faith in for blessing, help, direction, or meaning in place of God. You're a little bit more uncomfortable now. (laughs) I'm good. I'm not an idolater. Well, if you call it that, I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Anything, anything that I put my faith in for blessing, help, direction, or meaning in place of God. I think in our culture, we have ways that this happens and we don't even necessarily pay attention to it. I mean, we could go to like, what's the big three? Sex, money, and power. And those are easy. So let's go to like four, five, and six, okay? So what else can become this kind of a thing? The thing we trust in for our success that isn't God. And I think we see 
a few things on this list. Since we celebrated seniors in graduation, <laughs> uh, education, it's a good thing. It's a good thing until it becomes the main thing that we trust, I will succeed in life because, and instead of God, it becomes I've got a good degree. And, and some of you, this may be a pushback on the parent more than the student right now. So some of you parents may have like pushed your students in this way where even if unintentionally, what you've communicated is your life depends on how successful you are at school which means you're not communicating. Your life depends on the goodness of your heavenly father who loves you and cares for you. Worship him, follow him. He will take care of you. I preach to myself on this one. <laughs> you know, we're sell we had one of those seniors that graduated and, and we get all the conflicting conversations you get to have as parents too about the priority of school over the years and this. And, and man, I know there are times where We've probably made it feel that way, that your, your success in life depends on how you perform in the grades that you get. Made a few of you are uncomfortable. Let's just keep doing it. All right. Anybody ready to feel a little bit more tension in the room? What in the world do I mean by love? All right. We're in a culture that love gets to mean whatever you want it to mean, right? You pick, you choose. We also think love means I'm not confronted by any other truth. If you love me, you just accept me, which means whatever I want to do, you should just support and applaud. And, and that's what real love is. God who loves, who's defined as love, also confronts, calls out sin, tells us what to do. There are times in our life, if we're not careful, we prioritize love in such a way that we actually think that's more important than truth or God's directions or his instructions. And so what happens, right, is we put, again, God out of first and this desire to be loved and received and accepted first. And when someone, well, someone maybe pushes on a false belief that we have, we feel like they don't love us or how dare you? When sometimes the most loving thing we can do is to speak truth into a situation, right? And so God does that for us. Uh, let's do one more. All right, this is just mean now on the list. Family, like this guy just doesn't like anything like education or love or family. These are all good things. There's a, a great Christian theologian from many centuries before, um, Augustine. Augustine talked about wrong loves, like misguided loves. When he would talk about like idolatry, the sin we'd have in, he sometimes described it that way, that we get something that we love, even a good thing, but we get it out of place. And so we take what is a good thing and it becomes the main thing. And once again, there are times even in our own family, like, like if you had to choose, I'm not gonna ask you to say it, but let's say you were in a situation where you had to choose between obedience to God and the safety of your kids. Which do you choose? Even when, even when really good God-given gifts in our life become more important than him and our focus is on him, those more than him, they, they become functionally a false, a false God in our life. We, we need this commandment in our lives, right? To be reminded that God says, I'm God alone. Have nothing else, no other gods before, before me education, love, family. We'll skip past politics. <laughs> Let's just uh, move forward. Next question. Uh, we've got this great Old Testament law. For some of you th theological thinker types, you're thinking, well, how's that apply to me as a New Testament follower of Jesus? And isn't that like just all commands? And so Jesus is grace, right? And so wasn't that the whole point of Jesus that just the commands of God overcome grace? And it's, it's no, really Jesus and the good news of the gospel deepens what we understand of God's commands. It doesn't replace it. Um, Paul this New Testament church planter says about God's instructions, his commands. He's talking about the Old Testament. That's the only Bible he had. He says, whatever was written, like in the Bible, from the former days was written for our what? Instruction. Like Paul, as a follower of Jesus, knows God's words, those commandments instruct him to, um, to this day. It deepens his faith. You know, God's laws are not opposed to grace, but they become a means of grace. That was true for Israel. It's still true for us today, like where God's instructions are part of how he lovingly provides and directs our lives. How does the good news of Jesus then deepen 
deepen that in our lives. Think about this. While we worship God exclusively, right? I am God alone. We also turn from what we know of Jesus to Christ uniquely. That he becomes the one who who has done for us what the law alone never could. We, we realize we get these instructions and we can't follow them. Jesus provides for us in a way that the law in and of itself could only teach us, but we were never fully capable of doing. We turn to Christ uniquely and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit inwardly. God does amazing things in our lives as we allow him to do that. Here's the thing, we think of Jesus and the role he wants to play in our lives. If at the center of what we, what we guide our hopes and our dreams and our understanding around is that there's a God who loves us enough that he wrapped on flesh and came in the person of Jesus to be crucified for our sins, for our failure to actually obey the laws correctly. That God always knew we would never do that. God didn't give instructions in the desert to his people to be able to save them from Egypt. He already did that through his power. God doesn't give you those instructions today to save you, to restore your relationship with him. But as someone already forgiven because of what Jesus does, he still has those instructions to guide you, to help you to now live wisely with with him. As we prepare to close in a moment, we're going to be celebrating communion together. And we have this reminder in the elements of communion of what Christ has done on the cross for us. That there's two very small elements in the tables on the sides here. That they're small in size, but they're huge in their significance. There's a, a cup with juice inside that represents Christ's blood that was poured out for us as a sacrifice for our sins. And the small cracker that's Included with that reminds us that Christ's body was broken for us. If you think about the world of difference of what God did in his instructions to Moses on the people and what he did later in Jesus, I mean, think about this amazing comparison. We have with, with God in the foot of a mountain, he's given rules and commands, right, written on on stone tablets, God descended to give instructions through Moses. And Jesus, God himself, descended in the incarnation. Not to give commands written on stone, but as the word of God himself. To, to do what we never could do, to fulfill those commands perfectly in his own life. And then we have in, in this seeking of God on the mountain through, through Moses, we have in, instructions. But with Jesus, we have a savior, right? Right? We have uh, in the commandments that God gave to Moses, we have this idea of, of commandments written on stone tablets, but, but what God does through us in the scriptures, we're told is he writes on our own heart, that he inwardly transforms us, writing his commands on our heart so that, that our heart and our wills are actually changed and shaped. And so we're gonna celebrate communion together as a reminder that God loves us and now he demands to be first in our lives. And he has proven his love for us in so many ways, first and foremost, in his gift of his own son for us on the cross. And so as we celebrate communion today, if you're um, even new here to Harvest, our approach to this is you're welcome to participate. If you uh, call yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus, we take time once a month here to just celebrate the gift that he has given of his blood shed for us, body broken for us, to redeem us, to adopt us into God's family and to pay the penalty of our sin. And so um, we're gonna sing a song in a moment. But what I'm gonna ask you to do is the band is just leading musically. Um, come forward to one of these two tables. You'll take the uh, elements of communion with you back to your row. And as soon as we all get through that time, we're gonna take them together in just a couple of minutes as we close our service together.